Good evening. Um, my name is Abhishek Kekar. I'm a historian of South Asia, and it is my very great pleasure to introduce um, Ram Guha and bring him virtually, sadly, only virtually, to Berkeley today. So um, uh, Ram Guha needs really, truly no introduction to any audience um, that is familiar in any way um, with the public realm in India. He has, uh, over the last several decades, made huge contributions um, in three domains of intellectual life in India. The first is that of the environment um, and of the history of the Indian environment in which he has been a sort of pioneering thinker from his very first book, um, The Unquiet Woods, published in 1989. The second is the history of sport in India and that of cricket um, on which he continues to write. And thirdly, of course, is the history of India in the 19th and particularly the 20th centuries and his many, many books um, on the history of India, on Gandhi, on India before and after Gandhi. Um, and now most recently, uh, his book Rebels Against the Raj, which is a beautiful and moving and delightful book that we will have a chance to talk about at some length today. Um, and of course, um, I should also add that Ram Guha remains one of India's most trenchant political commentators, and his um, views are frequently to be heard um, in Indian newspapers everywhere. And I hope that if you ever get the chance to go to his website, you will see them. So without too much further ado, I look forward to welcoming um, Ram Guha to join us today. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, thank you all. Uh, uh, Last night, I got a panic email from uh, Purita Kala at Berkeley saying that because of uh, the change in time, I would have to get up an hour earlier. So uh, I got up at 4.30 a.m. I live in Bangalore. It brought me back to my days uh, in boarding school when I had to get up compulsory at the cack of dawn. But I'm delighted to be here and I would do anything for Berkeley because Berkeley is my absolutely my favorite place in the United States. You see Berkeley the town of Berkeley also. I spent two wonderful semesters there teaching in 97 and 98, and actually the origins of my scholarly interest in Gandhi go back to a course I taught your uh, brilliant and uh, argumentative undergraduates at Berkeley in 1997. And um, before I begin my talk, I'd like to dedicate it to the memory of a great Berkeley scholar, now no longer with us, the anthropologist Gerald Berryman. Who, whose book Hindus of the Himalaya is a pioneering ethnography of Indian village lives, life and particularly perceptive about the inequities of the caste system. And he was writing about uh, things like, you know, Dalit assertion back in the 1960s. And Jerry did his field work in a village not far from my hometown, Dehradun. And when I started my own doctoral research on forests and peasants in the Himalaya, he was of incalculable help in advising me and mentoring me. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging among my many, many other friends in Berkeley, living and not living, the late Gerald Berryman, professor of anthropology in Kroba Hall. So I'm gonna talk about this book, Rebels Against the Raj. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about the origins of the book before I talk about its contents and its arguments. Many years ago, I wrote a biography of a maverick British anthropologist called Veria Elvin, who was an Oxford scholar who came to India as a young man seeking to indigenize Christianity, left the church, joined Gandhi, left Gandhi, and then became the former scholar, exponent, and activist for the rights of India's Adivasi people. And I was fascinated by Elvin from the time I was a college student and eventually wrote a life of him, published in 1999. And I thought at that stage in 1999, which is uh, you know almost quarter of a century ago, that I'd write a sequel to that book, uh, a kind of collective portrait of white people who made their homes in India and did interesting and unusual things. And I'd given it a title, The Other Side of the Raj. I had made a short list of what, for 12 or 14 people and then I got distracted into other projects. And uh, 20 years later, I returned to the notes. But even when I was working on Gandhi and on contemporary Indian history, wherever in the archives I found something interesting or unusual on foreigners who had 
joined the Indian Freedom Movement, I made a file uh, of the notes I had found. And uh, after I finished the second volume of my Gandhi biography in 2018, I returned to my notes and I found them capacious enough to try and attempt a book. Now, one of Verrier Elvin's own abiding regrets is that he never went to jail. Uh, you know, he was quite close to Mira Ben Madeleine Slade, who many of you would know, the English admiral's daughter who was uh, adopted by Gandhi, was part of Gandhi's ashram, was with him for nearly two decades and spent, of course, a long time in prison along with Gandhi, including in Gandhi's last imprisonment in Pune uh, during the Second World War when Gandhi's wife, Kasuba, and Gandhi's secretary, Mahadev Desai, both died. Mira was by his side. So Elvin was slightly, shall we say, Elvin, envious of Mira Ben because while Elvin had done this extraordinary work in documenting the lives of Adivasi people, he'd even taken a, you know, uh, he even married an Adivasi girl. So he was totally Indian, except that during the period of the Raj, he never made the ultimate transgression by going to prison. Uh, so I thought, let me write a book about those who went to prison. And that was the defining category, uh, defining criteria uh, in my deciding whom to include and whom to exclude. Now, I had to exclude because of this uh, uh, definition, such remarkable people as C.F. Andrews, the English clergyman and scholar who was close to Gandhi and Tagore and did such important work uh, uh, drawing attention to the, uh, the uh, terrible sufferings of Indian indentured laborers in the Caribbean, in Fiji, and, 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 and South Africa. And Andrews was a true Western friend of India. So was Sister Nivedita, the Irish woman who worked with Swami Vivekananda uh, and played an important role in bringing Indian culture and philosophy to the West. So was a person I greatly admire myself, the Gandhian architect, Laurie Baker who settled in Kerala and was absolutely a pioneer of environmentally friendly, sustainable, low cost housing. But eventually I thought if I read a book about every admirable, sincere, selfless foreigner who came to India, it would be unmanageable. It would be like a Wikipedia entry of 500 names with a paragraph on each of them. So I used this uh, very strict, rigid criteria, only those who were either arrested or deported, and on whom I could find enough interesting and rich and rare archival material to tell a kind of compelling story. So eventually, this book features seven individuals, and I'll take you through their lives one by one and what they did. And after that, I'll draw some broader conclusions about uh, what this book is trying to say and in what ways it seeks to contribute uh, to the debates on Indian historiography, but also perhaps on the state of India and the world today in the 21st century. So chronologically, the first person is my, in my book is also probably the best known, Annie Besant, who comes to India in 1893 at the age of uh, 45. Now she had already made a name for herself as a suffragette, a fighter for women's rights, and a socialist uh, in England. And it, she had a kind of midlife crisis, which many of us go through, and abandoned radical socialism for a mystical creed called Theosophy, which had been founded by a Russian a woman called Madame Blavatsky, and which claimed to have been inspired by Hindu philosophy, and particularly by sages living in the Himalaya. So she comes to India in 1893. Now, while writing about Annie, Annie Besant, it struck me that 1893 is actually a very important role, uh, important year in the history of India's encounters with the West. It is in 1893 that Swami Vivekananda travels to Chicago to give his famous speech at the World Parliament of Religions. It's in 1893 that Gandhi moves to South Africa to begin two decades as a lawyer and an activist in the diaspora. It's also in 1893, since Abhishek mentioned cricket, that the first great cricketer of Indian origin, Kumar Sri Ranjit Singh Ji of Nawal Nagar makes his debut for Cambridge against Oxford and Lords. So in 1893, three Indians are making their mark in the West. And at the same time, this Western, middle-aged Western movement is actually moving East. 
uh, and Annie Besant starts as a theosophist. She becomes an educator. She starts schools for women. She helps found the Banaras Hindu University. And then in 1915, she dramatically engages herself in Indian politics. Uh, she is Irish by cultural origin. She's inspired by the Home Rule Movement in Ireland. And in 1916, starts a Home Rule League in India, uh, advocating a measure of self-rule, joins the Congress, is arrested, comes out a hero, and is then elected unanimously the first female president of the Indian National Congress in 1917. Uh, and has a very interesting and complicated life, and uh, then dies in the early 30s. So Annie Besant is the first chronologically, who, uh, a person who because in the book. The second of my rebels against the Raj is one of my favorites. He's a man called Benjamin Guy Horniman. There's a circle named after him in, in South Bombay, a beautiful shaded circle right opposite the Asiatic Society in one of the prettiest parts of what is my favorite city in India. Some of you will know it. And many people passing the Honeyman Circle don't know whom it's named for. They actually think koi Parsi ho gai. must be a Parsi because half the things in Bombay are named after Parsis. Nariman Point, and so they think Nariman, like Nariman Point, is Honeyman Circle. But actually, he was an Englishman, a radical journalist who uh, moved to Bombay in 1913 uh, to start a newspaper called the Bombay Chronicle, which had been funded by Indian nationalists as an alternative to the solidly pro-establishment Times of India. Incidentally, parenthetically, I should comment that 110 year, years later, the Times of India remains solidly pro-establishment, and there's good reason to found a new paper reflecting the views of the citizens of Bombay uh, 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 today. But anyway, the Bombay Chronicle was started in 1913. Honeyman was his first editor. Uh, he started the, he was a radical. He started the first union for working journalists um, in India. He wrote a lot about the rights of the working class. Uh, he was close to Gandhi and Patel and covered the, free, uh, the peasant movements in Gujarat that were part of the first non-cooperation movement. And then in 1919, he wrote a searing indictment in the Bombay Chronicle of the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh. And the British could not abide a white Englishman using his newspaper as a pulpit to rage against the Raj. So when these reports of the Jalyan Walabag massacre appeared in the Bombay Chronicle, the Bombay police went to Honeyman's house, dragged him away to the port, put him on a ship and sent him back to England, where he was in exile for seven years. And finally, through a, a, a array of interesting uh, strategies that I describe in the book, he came back in 1926, resumed his work as a journalist and did extraordinary work documenting the social, cultural, political lives of Indians and of people in Bombay in particular. He was close to many people in the freedom movement. He was also interestingly gay. So he was transgressive and radical, not just in his politics, but in his personal life. And uh, it's, I mean, even I am speaking to you from Bangalore, which is in some matters the most progressive city in India but it's not in matters of sexual freedom, right to choose, not one tenth as progressive perhaps as Berkeley is, and this is 2021, 2022. So think of Honeyman as a closet gay in Bombay in 1919, and you get a sense of what kind of person he was, apart from his politics and his journalism and his crusade for the freedom of the press. So he's the second person, chronologically. The third person is an American. The first American who features in this book, uh, a Quaker from the Pennsylvania area called Samuel, Samuel Evans Stokes, who comes to Himachal in the early years of the 20th century as part of a missionary outfit that gets disgusted with the church, starts wearing Indian clothes, marries an Indian girl, uh, joins Gandhi's non-cooperation movement, carries out a campaign against forced labor in the Shimla Hills, is imprisoned during the non-cooperation movement, spends several months in jail, and after he comes out, reorients himself away from politics towards spirituality, uh, gets interested in interfaith dialogue between Hindus and Christians, becomes a Hindu himself, changes his name from Samuel to Satyanand, 
And then being an, being an American, also his entrepreneurial gene set in and he plants the first apples in Himachal, laying the foundations of a multi-million dollar industry, which sustains the economy of Himachal Pradesh even today. As I said, he married an, America, uh, an Indian woman called Agnes. Uh, they had several children, grandchildren, uh, many of whom are active in Himachali public life and politics even today. They've been ministers, speakers of the assembly, they've started schools and so on. So the legacy of Stokes, the personal and familiar legacy of Samuel Satyaran Stokes continues in Himachal today. So he's number three. Number four is Mira Ban, Madeleine Slade, whom I've, uh, whom I've uh, briefly mentioned. And about her, I'll just say this, that while her work with Gandhi uh, is very well known, uh, that she was Gandhi's adopted daughter, she conducted campaigns on his behalf in Europe and North America. She went to prison. She was a fantastic at spinning and weaving. Uh, but she was also, after Gandhi died, she stayed on in India. And this is a part of her life, which is not that well known and which I've tried to document in my book. She moved to the Himalaya and uh, became a pioneering environmentalist. She set up an ashram first at the foot of the hills near the town of Rishikesh, where the Ganga comes out into the plains, and then later in the interior mountains in the Bilangana Valley, uh, not far from the now drowned town of Teri. And she did extraordinary work protecting forests, promoting biodiversity, uh, 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 you know, trying to work out methods of sustainable agriculture back in the 1950s. Uh, Later, when she was in her late 60s, because of her ill health, she moved back to Europe, where she retained her interest in Gandhi and played an absolutely critical role in inspiring Richard Attenborough's film, famous Oscar-winning film. Attenborough made several trips to see Mirabhan in, in, uh, uh, in, in Austria to seek her counsel. And then when the modern environmental movement broke out in the 1970s, early 1970s, Mira started writing in the international press about how Gandhi had warned against greed and consumption a very long time ago. So she is number four. Number five uh, is probably not well known, which is which actually possibly my favorite character in the book for reasons I'll describe. Uh, his name was Philip Spratt. He was a Cambridge communist who came to India in 1926 to blow up India. Uh, to organize a revolution inspired by the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. Uh, he worked with textile workers in Bombay, with railway workers in Calcutta. And then in 1929, he was uh, imprisoned as part of uh, the accused in the famous Beirut conspiracy case. He was actually the lead accused in that famous case in which many communists were arrested and incarcerated in a prison in Meerut in Northern India. And he spent seven years in prison. Now, just before he went to prison, he met a Tamil girl called Sita, who was the granddaughter of a legendary Tamil communist called Singaravelu Chatiyar, and kind of fell in love with her. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the kind of coy, shy way in which people fell in love back in the 1920s. And when he went to jail, he would write her these letters uh, every week, two letters a week. And those letters are in the possession of his family who lives in my hometown, Bangalore. And they very graciously gave me access to those materials, through which you can track not only a moving, uh, passionate love story between an Englishman and an Indian woman, but also the evolution of Spratt's views. In, in jail, he was cured of his communism. He started reading Gandhi, and he was disgusted with what he was reading about the excessive violence in Russia and so on. And he comes out of prison, moves, stays on, marries Sita, has several children, gets a job in Bangalore, editing a weekly called Mice India, standing for Mysore India, whose printing press was actually just behind where I'm speaking from, which is another reason I like Spratt. Spratt or Spratt also patronized a lovely secondhand bookstore which still exists called the Select Bookstore. Many of uh, the books in the bookshelf behind me are, were, were gathered from Select Bookstore. But there are many reasons why I like Spratt. Not, not least because Gandhi cured me of communism myself, as reading Gandhi cured me of communism myself at a young age. So he comes out, uh, moves further right. I haven't moved as, I must confess, I haven't moved, moved as, as far right as Pratt did. 
and joins the Swatantra party and becomes an ideologue for free market capitalism of the Swatantra variety. And along the way, writes a pioneering study of the Hindu personality using the theories of Jung and Freud. You know, so a very interesting, unusual character. He's number five. I'll come very quickly to number six and seven. Number six is again an American called Ketan, who was uh, like Stokes a missionary, except that unlike Stokes, he did not work in the Himalaya, but in deepest South India, not far from Madure. Uh, he was deported twice for his, uh, he started reading Gandhi and Tagore, walk Hadi, left the church, identified with the freedom struggle and was deported twice for that, came back each time when he was permitted to, and in the 50s and 60s, helped found the pioneering rural university in Dindigal near Madurai, uh, which is named after Gandhi. It's called the Gandhi Gram Rural Institute, another pioneering environmentalist and proponent of appropriate technology, and a great nurturer of young talent. Many of the very influential social workers in Tamil Nadu, including a couple whom every uh, middle-aged or elderly Tamil knows, uh, Shankar Lingam and Krishnamal Jagannathan were trained and mentored by Kaita. He's number six. Number seven uh, is a woman, born Sarla Devi, uh, born Catherine, May, Catherine Mary Heilman, an English woman who comes to India in the 1930s, teaches as, as a school teacher, is teaching in a school in Udaipur called Seva Mandir, which still exists. Learns about Gandhi, goes to Seva Gram, joins his Antaraj, falls sick, and then goes to the Himalaya to recover and spends the, left, the rest of her life from the early 1940s to the early 1980s in a town, small hamlet called Kosani, which has the most gorgeous views of the snows. Very beautiful small hamlet in interior Uttarakhand, where she sets up the first girls' school for women. Uttarakhand, which is my home state, well, the state I grew up, is even by Indian standards, unbelievably patriarchal. Women are not, in the 1940s, no young girls went to school. And she starts a pioneering girls school, with, and again, like Mira Ben and Kaitan, was actually a precocious environmentalist, and several of her wards went on to become leaders of the celebrated Chipko movement. So this is the kind of uh, a cast of seven uh, characters, all of whom are, in my view, interesting, unusual, controversial, all of whom wrote a great deal. So they were actually not just uh, activists and freedom fighters, but thinkers uh, 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 and writers. Now, all of them knew Gandhi. They had some connection to Gandhi. And this I discovered, uh, let me say this, that they, uh, they uh, two, in the course of writing this book, they were too happy, not happy, uh, how do I put it, uh, too, uh, kind of accidental occurrences, which I think probably make this book more uh, uh, useful and relevant than I thought it would be. As I said, I always wanted to write this book. I was fascinated by Elwin. I was very intrigued by what would motivate uh, people from uh, wealthy, prosperous, powerful countries leading comfortable lives to exchange this for a life of uncertainty, struggle and sac sacrifice in a poor, desperately uh, uh, you know, problematic country like India. Normally migration is the other way from India to the West. So I was intrigued by this phenomenon and I wanted to write about these seven people who actually joined the freedom struggle and provided a very different kind of light on India's encounter with the modern West. But I did not expect uh, uh, to find in this book that Gandhi would figure. I was writing about these seven individuals and it so turned out that all of them had interactions with Gandhi, relations with Gandhi, which varied. Mira Benz was absolutely reverential. Annie Besant was adversarial because Annie Besant was president of the Indian National Congress in 1917. She was a major public figure at, in India a decade before that when Gandhi was an obscure lawyer in South Africa. And when Gandhi came back and in through the roller satyagraha and the non-cooperation movement of 1919-20, dramatically seized the leadership of the Indian national movement. Ali Besant felt sidelined, ignored, 
and rivalrous. So she had these complicated feelings of animosity towards Gandhi. Spratt had kind of a very interesting engagement lifelong. Meera Band was reverential. Stokes, who was close to Gandhi, later disagreed, partly because of Gandhi's fetish for freedom. Stokes left the Congress because Gandhi said every member of the Congress must mandatorily spin every day and produce so many yards of cloth per year. And he said, this is absurd. What kind of, you know, even Tagore, by the way, uh, uh, objected to what was called the spreading franchise. And later, he, uh, Stokes also had a famous disagreement with Gandhi, which I write about in my book, where he wrote him a brilliant, moving, uh, prescient letter in July of 1939, urging Gandhi to abandon his dogmatic adherence to non-violence and support the British in the upcoming war against Hitler. Because as he said, if you think British imperialism is bad, just wait till Hitler and the Japanese conquer India and you'll know how awful they are. So all of them had interesting engagements with Gandhi that show light on this uh, endlessly fascinating figure who is the Mahatma. Uh, they worked in different parts of India. You know, uh, uh, some in the Himalayas, some in Madras, some in Bombay. Uh, their life, sp life covers a hundred years of Indian history from um, 1893 when Annie Besant uh, arrives to 1984 when Kaitan dies. And so it's just, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's, 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 it's biography as a window into colonial and post-colonial history. And several of them were critics of Nehru, Nehru's economic policies, environmental policies, educational policies, and they felt absolutely confident because of their commitment to India to be free and frank and direct, as free and frank and direct uh, under Indian rule, under the rule of the Congress party, as they had been under the rule of the British. So I think what attracted me to them was the range of their interests, their diversity, their lives, and their absolutely stubbornly independent minded character. And of course, the corpus of interesting and unusual writings they left behind. Now, as I said, when I began writing this book, I had no clue that uh, Gandhi would figure so centrally in this narrative, but he did. Nor did I have a clue that it would come out uh, in the, and this is a pure chance and coincidence that the book has come out uh, at a time, uh, it's come out in the 75th year of Indian independence, when we mark the 75th anniversary of Indian independence, and at a time when xenophobia is rife in my country, where Indians are taught all sources of ancient, medieval, and modern knowledge are with Indians and with Hindus particularly, and we have nothing to learn from anyone else. You know, so uh, I didn't expect the book to come out either in the 75th anniversary of independence or uh, uh, in a climate of rising jingoism and closed-mindedness and uh, xenophobia tending towards paranoia. But I'm happy that this, hap that this has happened because I think my book is, of course, it's principally a group portrait of seven remarkable individuals through whose interwoven lives you can shed light on the history of my country, the colonial and the post-colonial history of this large and complicated country. But it's also eventually a kind of morality play. It's a, it's a caution against xenophobia. And it's a caution not against and not only about xenophobia and rising xenophobia and jingoism in, in India, but across the world, because this is now a global phenomenon. I mean, if you look at uh, Donald Trump and the white supremacists, if you look at Xi Jinping and the conviction that China is the center of the world and destined to rule the world, if you look at Russia, what is happening in Russia today under Putin, if you look at Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers, if you look at the rise of right wing jingoism in France, yeah, Victor Orban in Hungary. So I think my book, The Lives of These People, speaks to a lot of what is happening in the world today. Uh, I'll just end there and say uh, two things. One is, I really, really enjoyed writing this book. I mean, I, I think the lives were so fascinating and uh, I found so much interesting and new material on all of them. And among the challenges was writing about women. You know, I have, I'm a historian who's also a biographer. So I wrote a life of Elwin, which I have mentioned. Uh, Abhishek talked about my work on Gandhi. Uh, 
Also, I've written on cricket, which is actually about individual cricketers often, not just their sporting achievements, but their social location and sometimes their personal and political struggles. My book, A Corner of a Foreign Field, is centered around the life of a family of Dalit cricketers, particularly eldest brother, Palwankar Balu. So I have a long uh, interest in writing biographical portraits, large and small. Many of my newspaper columns are actually about individuals. There's a column of mine coming on Saturday, uh, which is about a remarkable Indian woman, uh, writing, uh, uh, very brave and courageous Indian female writer who turns 95 soon. Let me, let me tell you no more. But generally I've written about men and to probe the lives of these three women, Madeline Slade stroke Meera Ben, uh, Catherine Heilman stroke Sarla Devi and Annie Besant was a challenge for me. You know, it was something new uh, to, for me to actually try and write seriously, rigorously and empathetically about women. And that's about the things in retrospect I, I most enjoyed about working on this book. So thank you and I'll hand it over to Abhishek. Um, thank you, Ram, so much for this uh, brief introduction. Um, I, before we begin, I'd just like to ask all of our not inconsiderable number of attendees to please put any questions they might have in the chat box, um, in the Q&A box. And uh, they are all visible to me and to Ram, and we'll try to get to some of them. And um, if there are any questions that we cannot get to today, I do apologize, but um, we it is our standard practice to dispatch all questions um, to Ram Guha. So we will send them to him and he may reply to them at his own leisure. But I have many, many questions of my own. I mean, I, I, I just, um, I spent the day with this book um, and I, um, as I said before, I found it deeply moving and very beautiful in many ways. Um, and so I will try to not ask the kinds of questions that will dissuade you from going out and buying a copy because I think it is a book worth reading. Truly, and so I hope that those of you who are here will consider getting it. So let me, instead of asking questions directly at the heart of the matter, sort of begin by circling around a little bit and ask, ask you questions about peripheries um, for this book. So one of the things that's very striking about this book as a historian, and I'm of course a historian of medieval India, and so I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't claim any knowledge or expertise in the 20th century. It's many centuries after what I know. Um, but I will say that one of the things that I found quite remarkable and fascinating about it was the kind of historiographical reorganization of the 20th century as a unit. Um, so that the story really begins, as you say, in 1893 and ends in 1984. And the moment of independence um, in 1947 is a kind of halfway point, um, which makes us, which changes the way that we look at the history of India in many ways. Um, so, so the first question I guess I have for you, um, and this is sort of a big question, but I'll ask it in two parts, you know, is the question that reading this book, it seems to me that the first half of this book is really suffused with the language of love. Um, and it is the language of, you know, the experience of love, of transformative experiences, of somebody opening a book about Gandhi and immediately deciding to buy a ticket to move to India. Um, about the kinds of love that happens in the ashram, about love between people, love that does not say its name. Um, so really, I mean, you know, this kind of intense language of profound, deep, immediate love um, suffuses, as I said, the first half of this book. And the second, you know, if the second half of this book is about anything, um, post-independence, it seems to be about the question of land. Um, and the engagement with land and the things that people do with land and the way that they live on the land and the ways in which the land becomes a nation. Um, even though the people, many of the people who are described in this book don't see themselves as national um, or become national late or reluctantly um, and do not you know, have commitments to the land that supersede their commitments to the nation. And you have very poignant examples of this round where you describe the fact that all of the people who are described here remain trenchant critics um, of all regimes in power, including the post-colonial regime, whether or not they live in India, right? Yeah. So in a sense, they have a higher, higher calling and engagement with the land. And therefore, you know, the land in literal terms, you know, so Vinova Bhave obviously is an important figure who moves in the second half of this book and animates many people. But also, um, 
also the question of uh, organic farming, for instance, also the question of the environment itself, also the question of the oak tree, also the question of manure. So, so you know, there are there are really a kind of remarkable move from a history of ideas and persons and engagements with each other as they happen in Gandhi's shadow to a kind of engagement with the substance of India after Gandhi's death. And I was wondering if you want to say something about how we should understand this century itself in these terms. I mean, what is the story of the 20th century for India refracted through the prism um, of the experiences of these people um, that tells us something about what happened here, you know, from 1893 to 1984? No, your, your, your comments are beautifully put. And let me try and uh, answer them as best as I can. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say, before I answer your specific question, let me say why I, how, what predisposed me to uh, take this entire arc from uh, 1893 to 1984. You know, I'm by training a sociologist. And uh, in that sense, I was lucky that I came to history late and uh, uh, disregarded the colonial and post-colonial divide, which is so entrenched in how we think of Indian history. And I really have always thought of it as a continuity, as, you know, uh, as 47 marks an important departure in some ways, but in some ways it doesn't matter at all. You know, people live, think, struggle, and so on. And from my first book, The Unquiet Woods, we actually started again in the late 19th century and carried on to the 1980s. But your substantive question is really beautifully put, and I'd love to reflect on it and very quickly give you my, my first thoughts on it. Love and land is the way you put it. And, you know, uh, if we had this conversation before I was writing this book, I would have put it in the book. And it would have been it. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, I think here, here are people who are coming with a sense of idealism and mission. They're coming to, uh, they're first coming to serve India, to understand and serve India. So they... Um, meet people who befriend them. They're moved by suffering. They want to ameliorate, ameliorate it. So it's about interpersonal relations. It's about building groups, about camaraderie, collegiality, uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So at that, India is independent. And it's not no, no longer about serving and understanding India, but about reforming, reshaping, and realizing India. You know, so because the British have gone. And there are all these ideals and hopes. And what do they lie in? They lie in, uh, you know, uh, economic, uh, more, uh, more econo uh, the, the first half of the book is more emotional. The second half of the book, crudely, in some ways, is more material and economic. Because you want to talk about, now that the British have gone, you can't blame them anymore for your poverty, your suffering, your inequality, your conflicts. We have to find a phase of resolving it. So whether it is through what Sarla Devi does, starting a school, sending social workers, training that school to different parts of the Himalaya, uh, to uplift women, to bring primary health care, to uh, pr protect the environment. Training is so important. So Sarla Devi starts a school. Kaitan starts a university, uh, inspired by Gandhi's ideas. Uh, Spratt proselytizes through the movement through the, through the medium of his column. You know, he's educating and advocating reform and reshaping Indian economy, Indian polity, Indian institutions through his writings, not through on-ground work. But I think it's the way you put it is actually very appropriate to capture what they're trying to do because the first part, they want to <coughs> show that they care for India. They may be white, they may be Christian, they may be from imperialist background, but they empathize with the sufferings and the struggles <clears throat> not of India in the abstract, but of ordinary Indians. So the friendships they cultivate, the roots they develop in the course of their travels. And then, of course, after India has become independent, it's a question of reconstruction, reform, reshaping, to realize uh, the dreams of what India can and should mean. And, of course, uh, ending poverty and suffering. Now, one of the things is, I should say, is you talk about the land. Here and there in the book, I, uh, I quote people writing about the countryside. Now, again, this is something I'm not an expert about, and I don't want to get into cultural essentialism. But with the possible exception of some early Sanskrit poetry, 
and uh, the Sangam literature of medieval Tamil Nadu. Indian literature, Indians are, you know, don't really comment on landscape. They don't write about contours and trees and waters and so on. I think it's, it's, a, it's a, more of a Western sensibility. You know, for example, Ketan, there's a, there's a quote from Ketan early in this book about the landscape of rural South India, the coconut, the coconut uh, groves, the rivers, the village architecture and so on. And I think that's also a feature of this book. I think in some ways, I don't know what the reason for that is. You know, maybe it's a lot to do with 19th century European poetry, which was suffused with, you know, descriptions of nature, sensitive, fine-grained, lyrical descriptions of nature. But yes, I mean, the engagement with the land and with the landscape, I would say not so much, with the land as well as the landscape is actually a marked feature of many of these people. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that because, um, you know, when you were saying, you know, when you were talking about Indian engagements with the landscape, I was thinking of one of my favorite late 17th century geographers, um, somebody called, um, supposedly called Sujan Rai Bhandari, you know, who writes a gazetteer of North India in which he has loving descriptions of the rivers and lands of Punjab and North India. So there is that, but it's interesting that that doesn't show up in our modern imaginary. Um, and this actually leads me to a second question, which I which I wanted to sort of ask you about, which is that, um, uh, you know, this profound loving engagement with India, which seems to come through or be powered or shaped through theosophy, is obviously absolutely critical in channeling um, these sensibilities uh, and the bearers of these sensibilities into India. Um, and is this the reason why, or would you like to reflect a little bit on what it is about this, which makes these people who come to India see it primarily or only as a space of Hinduism? Um, so that, you know, um, I think I counted precisely one place where somebody says that they read the Quran while in prison on Gandhi's urging, no less, right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. but there is, but it's kind of interesting that for many of these people who come to India, um, they acknowledge the presence of Muslims, they see the presence of Muslims. Pratt has, uh, you know, his, 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 uh, you know, his um, favorite successor is somebody uh, whose name is Sayyid Ahmad Brailvi, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, but, but on the whole, it seems to me that the vision of the land that they come to is a resolutely Hindu and blinkeredly Hindu vision. So why is that? That's a very, again, a very interesting question. I mean, of course, they have Muslim friends. So uh, just a small correction. I mean, it's Horniman's successor who's Horniman, Muslim. Sorry, that's right. That's right. That's and right. Sprite yeah. has a close friend who's uh, uh, Muzaffar Ahmed, uh, in, in, you know, his, his main co-conspirator in, uh, in the communist movement, uh, whom I quote several times in the book. Uh, uh, but it is rare. You know, and even the Muslims whom they're befriending are, you could say, secularized Muslims, you know, atheistic Muslims, you know, uh, probably. So, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's to do, uh, uh, I think uh, quite a lot of this has to do, at least early on with theosophy. Uh, it's also possibly to do with Gandhi. I mean, there was a, I mean, Gandhi was a, he was as far removed from Hindutva as any Hindu could be, but he was Hindu. You know, he was a Hindu who believed in engagement, in dialogue, in interfaith harmony, you know, but uh, so maybe some of that, uh, you know, comes from that. I mean, uh, Kosani, for example, where, where Bira Ben, study, uh, where Sarla Ben settles, is important in uh, uh, the Gandhian iconography because, I mean, it's a beautiful town. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, ham hamlet, used to be a hamlet. It has the best views of Nanda Devi Trishul, and when the sunlight glints on them, I mean, I went there, it's just fabulous. And the great Hindi poet, Sumitra Nandan poet, uh, Pant was born there, and much of his poetry evokes that. But it's the place where Gandhi revived his, revised his commentary on the Gita. So even, you know, Kosadi is in the kind of Gandhian landscape, notable for that. Yeah, I mean, Ali Bassett, interestingly, says something, by the way, among the stray comments on Islam and on individual Muslims in the book, there's a very interesting comment of Ali Bassett where um, she says, uh, maybe I won't find it, it'll take me too much time to find it, but she makes a very interesting point relevant to what's going on in India today. It's kind of a sweeping history of India. And she says, unlike the British who looted India and went back, the Muslims stayed here and became part of this land. So even though she has a kind of a largely Hindu 
classical Hindu, even sometimes Brahminical, Brahminical view of, of Indian civilization, Ali Besant, unlike some Indian idol, Hindu ideologues today, does not see Muslims as outsiders. So she emphatically says, you know, that uh, there's a kind of a, uh, that they were, they came and stayed here and became like us, unlike the British who looted and, and, and went back. But you are right. I mean, it, it, it is a largely, oh, and even uh, the Christians who come are disenchanted with the church and move towards actually Hinduism. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a sort of, though, I mean, I should add that there is the, you know, wonderful vision of Gandhi sitting in the fading dusk at Fatehpur Sikri. That's right. Uh, you know, writes about it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, contemplating yeah. this, and in fact, it's also true that Annie Besant, as you yourself write, um, you know, makes the point that under the Mughals, of course, certain offices were reserved for the Hindus, whereas, um, as she sardonically says, our Indians to be a race of clerks under yeah. the British. So that's you know, so there are there are certainly engagements. Um, but let me ask a question. Let me just jump in and ask a question yes, from yeah, Sharad Chari. Well, yes. Before you continue, before you continue. Okay, just again, uh, you know. Uh, the Bombay Chronicle is a, one of my hopes is that someone should write a biography of the Bombay Chronicle, uh, which is an extraordinary newspaper. But Horniman was the first editor. Uh, then he was deported. And then he was replaced by a man called Marmaduke Pictol, who then became a Muslim and wrote these, you would know what his works, Islam. And then comes Bailey. So, you know, it would be interesting to look at that in the, in the evolution of the Chronicle. So, I mean, Marmaduke, because it's a splendid name, Marmaduke Pictol is a splendid name by itself. And of course, in the 1920s, for a British newspaper edit, editor in Bombay to become a scholar of Islam uh, and actually embrace Islam. I wonder, is there any writing on him, just as an aside? Is there any, I, I, it is to follow. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but that's absolutely fascinating. And I did look him up a little bit today. I hadn't realized that he had been editor of the Bombay Chronicle. Um, and, you know, on this note, we should also add that, you know, Pakistan's first minister of culture, I believe, was Muhammad Asad, who himself is, you know, not born in India. So, 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 so this is, this is endlessly fascinating, but let me, let me jump in to ask a question that's also been sort of on my mind, um, which comes from my colleague, Sharad Chari. So Professor Chari, uh, I'm just going to read the question out because it's an interesting question. You know, he, he says that he remembers a wonderful EPW article some years ago in which you wrote um, uh, uh, on intertwined biographies. And he says, why did you decide on imprisonment or deportation as a criterion? Was it the question of xenophobia that led you to this? And since you call them all white, why are they all white? Were there other third worldists who may have been in your set or did the prominent ones tend to return to their own countries? Yeah, so I, I obviously, like all works of history, this is part, a contribution to an ongoing conversation. And in my epilogue, I talk about three or four others whom I didn't include. I, unlike you say, for example, in the case of, um, some other liberation movements uh, in Africa, for example, or in uh, they weren't they wasn't they weren't you know um, uh, they weren't people from elsewhere coming in. They were Sri Lankan sympathetic to the Indian freedom struggle. Uh, they were Nepalese who were in a similar Indian freedom struggle. I mean, Sarah's comment is quite interesting because, for example, someone I've written about elsewhere, B. P. Koirala, the first democratic prime minister of Nepal in the 1950s after the Rana's fell was jailed under the, uh, you know, he was very close to Jayaprakash Narayan and the Indian socialists. And he was, uh, he was a Nepali fighter for Indian freedom in the, in, in the 1930s and was jailed. There was a Sri Lankan called Bernard Aluvi Hare who was close to Gandhi. So it would, be, it would be an interesting show. I mean, it would be interesting. To, there's a great book to be written and Sharad, of course, works in South Africa. Uh, uh, so it would be a great book to be written about not necessarily people who came to India and, um, a kind of identified and lived in India, but how the Indian freedom movement and the different strands of the Indian freedom movement, not restricted to the Gandhi and the Congress, but the broader panoply of the Indian freedom struggle. How was, how are the Africans and the Latin Americans and the Southeast Asians looking at it? You know, I think that would be something that would be interesting to study. The reason I um, fixed on deportation was that I wanted to make it manageable. As I said, I didn't want to make it about 50, 80, 100 people, and then where do you stop? And I wanted to write about people about whom I had interesting new archival material. Ketan, for example, is the last figure in my book, and I wasn't going to include him till I found his papers uh, in a hospital in uh, uh, a small town called Odan Chakram where he died, and his papers were still in the room where he died, and 
uh, the managers of the hospital kindly granted me access. Now, one other thing I'd say, I'd say uh, again, this is a broader question, but Sharachari may be particularly interested in this. I make a comparison in the epilogue of my book uh, between the renegades I'm writing about and uh, the white radicals in South Africa who threw in their lot with the anti-apartheid struggle, you know, because they were also renegades. They were betraying their race and their religion and their imperial privilege. You know, people whom um, Sharad would know much better than me, people like Brian Fisher and Ruth First and Joe Slovo and Alby Sachs and so on. So I think this, this kind of, you see, because if it's other, I think, I mean, in, in that sense, this is really, really a book I mean, my past as not just a biographer of Gandhi, but as someone who's broadly sympathetic to Gandhi is part of this, you know, because in a sense, uh, I believe that obviously, you know, uh, any form of discrimination to end it, the fight against discrimination has to be led by those who suffer that discrimination directly uh, and most immediately. So the feminist movement obviously has to be led by women. The Dalit movement has to be led by, by, um, by Dalits and led and, and organized by Dalits. The movement for racial equality in America is essentially uh, for African-Americans to lead. But as a Gandhian, I believe in the possibility, possibility of redemption. I don't draw rigid boundaries. I don't think all Brahmins are bad. I don't think all whites are bad. I don't think all men are bad. I don't think all, all straight people are necessarily zero uh, homophobic. You know, I, I, maybe this is something to do with how the way I view progress and reform that I wanted to write about these white people who became Indians. Yeah, but just, just, to, just to add to this, I mean, I think, you know, you, in a sense, you're understating the critical intervention here um, in the sense that, um, you know, as you make perfectly clear, and especially through the language, the very beautiful language of the colonial state itself, which always speaks, you know, in the language of the necessity of having to throw somebody into jail. Yeah. It's that, you know, either you come into contact with the colonial state or you don't. Um, and when you come into contact with the colonial state, you invariably pay a price and you make those prices very clear in the yeah. poverty of the circumstances of the people who come into contact with the state and are deported uh, of the people who, you know, have to uh, go to jail, the people who lose their health. Um, so, so I think I think that it is a kind of interesting criterion to be able to say that, um, you know, there's one thing called moral support and holding a placard. There's one thing saying, as you know, some Indian political so-called thinkers who are very famous today, you know, who pledge and say in 1924 that they will never participate in politics again, yeah, yeah, for instance, yeah. such as, you know, a certain Veer Savarkar. And then, you know, there are those who say that we cannot give such pledges yeah, um, yeah. according to the dictates of our conscience. And if it requires us to be jailed for that, then we will go to jail. So I think, I think, in, you know, I, I, I've become a big believer in assessing statements by the prices they cost yeah, and statements yeah. that cost nothing are worth less to me than statements that cost, you know, three months of jail time in the hills. Absolutely, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, so, so let me let me ask let me ask some more questions. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, when I was reading the section on Annie Besant, I felt shades of Lytton Strachey in a kind of almost ironic, uh, you know, on a slightly ironic engagement with you know somebody who was obviously a difficult person um, and yeah. comes through as a difficult person a hundred years uh, later in the sources. I mean, it's kind of interesting that the affect of sincerity is really sharp um, for all of the other lives. So, you know, for um, Satyanand, for instance, um, yeah. you know, there is no ironic distance as possible from a figure like Satyanand for the reader. Um, yeah. But, but you know, speaking specifically of, um, yeah, so I, I, you know, so, 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 so was there, you know, so clearly Indians were ambivalent about Annie Besant and increasingly so over the course of the 20th century. But was there ambivalence about these others um, but for the Indian interlocutors or were they sort of welcomed yeah. broadly with um, love and admiration, you know, in the same degree that they expressed for India themselves? So I think uh, that's a, a fascinating question and thank you for asking it. And it really 
uh, you know, encourage me to uh, reflect more deeply on what I've written and why I've written and how I've written it. I mean, I, my, I think you're probably right that uh, uh, my own portrait of Annie Besant is the most ambivalent. I mean, I'm not completely uncritical of the rest, but I'm more critical of Annie Besant than probably I am of others. And I think uh, that's, that's perhaps because she was certainly had a very high sense of self-regard. She saw herself, she had a savior complex too to use a commonly used term. I don't think any of the others had a savior complex. You know, they had come to serve, to listen, to understand, to suffer. Annie Besant at some stage decided she had come to save India. First, she decided she'd come to make India theosophist. And then of course, to lead the freedom struggle. You know, um, I mean, she was kind of the matriarch of uh, the Indian home rule movement. So she had a very high sense of self-regard. Uh, she also, and that's partly because alone among the seven individuals in this book, uh, she came and she already achieved considerable distinction uh, uh, in her home country. She was a major public figure. The others came when they were much younger. They came in their 20s. Annie Besson came in uh, her 40s. And, you know, I, I mentioned in the book how, what she was called. I mean, she had two bases. I mean, to her credit, I mean, she was a person of tireless energy and, you know, uh, and so on. Uh, becoming a political activist again at the age of 70. And she had a base in South India and in North India. So Madras, which was not then Chennai, and Banaras were her twin, uh, the twin poles of her Indian existence. And in Banaras, she was known as Badi Bhemsa. And in Madras, she was known as Periyamma, which is like big mother, right? So big, 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 big lady and big, big mother. So I think part of it, and then of course, uh, I think it's because of this great sense of uh, self-belief, not just self-regard, self-regard and self-belief uh, that she was more open to criticism. And I think as the Indian freedom struggle got more vernacularized, you know, Ali Besson's followers were essentially middle-class, upper-caste, English-speaking males in Northern and Southern India. And as Gandhi particularly started reaching out into the countryside, drawing OBCs into the movement, uh, you know, women, other women in the movement. I think she kind of got marginalized and to, uh, took it pretty badly. But I think uh, she, in many ways, she was a, a you know, a, a force of nature. I mean, to, uh, to do the kind of things she did at her age, you know, start newspapers, start universities, uh, uh, and be absolutely resolute and, uh, you know, certain that one day she would be recognized as the true founder of, uh, the Indian national spirit. Uh, but I think you're right. I think, uh, and I think but because she was such a larger than life figure, she attracted all these reactions pro and con. None of the others were actually famous in that sense. They were interesting um, middle range figures. You know, Spratt was moderately well known as a journalist and as a propagandist. Stokes uh, is much better known posthumously because of what Himachal, the Himachal Apple industry has become. You know, now he's regarded as the founder of Himachal's economic prosperity. But in his lifetime, he was again uh, working in a few villages as part of one district. Ketan was really uh, active in southern Tamil Nadu, nowhere else. Sarla uh, Ben was active in Uttarakhand. Ali Besant and Meera Ben were, in a sense, all India figures. And uh, the, uh, the rest, I think, are in some ways more interesting because Honeyman was a man of Bombay, you know, he was really a man of that city, uh, and rooted in that city. And I'm very, very glad that um, that circle is named after him. But I think because they weren't larger than life, they weren't public figures in that sense, and they weren't controversialists. I mean, Annie Besant was kind of inviting controversy, including all her views on caste. I mean, I talk about uh, her essentially Brahminical view of uh, of Hindu civilization and, and the critiques that that, uh, uh, that that provoked. So yes, she does stand out in that sense that she is the most uh, uh, open to criticism, both in her lifetime and possibly also retrospectively. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it, the, the question of language is absolutely fascinating because um, uh, is Annie Besson perhaps one of the few who does not master or learn an Indian language, whereas everybody who comes into uh, into contact with Gandhi in some way 
um, engages with an Indian language. Anyway, so this, 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 this. Uh, let me just ask two questions from our uh, question and answer board. One by Omar Khan and one by Deepu Purkayasta, which sort of, um, I think, address similar themes. You know, so Omar Khan asks, um, to what extent do you think a common critique of their own cultures, uh, or seeing some deficiency in that, brought them to India to support its causes? Uh, and Tipu Purkayasta asks, uh, do you feel after a great tradition of foreigners who made India home to the extent that they were ready to go to jail for her, has nationalism turned us into an inward looking society uh, or country suspicious of anything from the West? So I suppose, you know, the questions really are about critiques yeah. working both, you know, towards the Anglo-American world and towards India um, in the past and the present. You know, uh, all, as I said, Adi Besant, I think they came for different motivations. Annie Besant, so it would be wrong to ascribe a single, even a single master explanation for why all of them came. Annie Besant came because theosophy was said to have its roots in India. And because she was the one such a wonderful orator, uh, the Theosophical Society thought she would, and India was a very large country with a growing middle class. And uh, people thought that she would win a lot of converts and she was happy to, uh, think that she would win a lot of converts. Spratt became came because he was a communist and he was convinced that India would follow the Russian path. Two of them came as uh, idealistic missionaries, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Stokes and Kethan. Uh, eventually, of course, they did de develop critiques of their own culture, but they came for a different motivation. The question about xenophobia, absolutely. You know, I think uh, in a column, it's not in this book, but in a column um, uh, not long ago, uh, if I can find it, uh, let me see if I can just, uh, I, I wrote about, I wrote about, you know, uh, will you give me a minute? I'll just find this column. Absolutely. Um, yeah. oh, just give me one minute. And, and while you do that, I'm ready yeah. to ask you another question, if you like. Yeah. Right. Do it. I, 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 no, let me, I, I found it. Okay. Now, this is about xenophobia. Now, uh, uh, two things. One is Indians... Indians were indeed uh, much more open uh, to other cultures uh, during the colonial period, uh, coincidentally. This is uh, a quote from Usha Mehta, who was a young, a remarkable Indian woman who at the age of 20 started an underground radio during the Quit India movement called the Congress Radio and then spent many years in jail and so on. And this is what, she, this is what the Congress Radio says in October 19. 42. She's saying about what India needs. October 1942, Usha Mehta, a Gujarati, young Gujarati socialist from Bombay. Gujarati, emphasize, Gujarati socialist from Bombay says, we need Germany's technical skill, her scientific knowledge, her music. We need England's liberalism, her culture and literature. We need Italy's elegance. We need the old achievements and new triumphs of Russia. We need the la gift of laughter, beautiful laughter, loving Austria. We need her culture, her gracious love of living and China. What shall we say of China? We need her wisdom, her courage and her new hope. We need the glow and, and spirit of adventure of young America. We need the knowledge, the childlike simplicity of the primitive people. We need all mankind for the resurrection of peace for the resurrection of our own dignity. In the middle of the Second World War, during the Quit India movement, the 20-year-old Usha Mehta is telling Indians what we need from the rest of the world. At West and East, it's China and Japan, as well as Germany and Russia. I mean, it's an extraordinary statement. Uh, you know, so that is the kind of spirit that was there. And it was, I think the Indian freedom struggle was suffused by it. And we kind of lost it. You know, uh, this book, by the way, as you would have noticed, is dedicated to Jean Dres, you know, uh, the Belgian born uh, Indian economist, I mean, India's finest developed economist who knows the villages and countryside of India much better than I do, who speaks better Hindi than I do, and so on. So I think this open mindedness, and I think it's a, probably a global phenomenon. I mean, I think the British are now realizing what a dreadful mistake Brexit was, but they won't acknowledge it. I mean, if you look at the kind of deranged speeches Putin has been making about Russian greatness, if you think of how Xi Jinping's sense of national uh, grandeur and civilizational supremacy, where it is taking China today, 
you know and i think this is something that is much broader and i think uh, this book is an attempt to uh, to counter it but this quote from usha mehta that has died out i mean it's a fabulous and it's representative i mean she was usha mehta was a remarkable young socialist activist but it was redolent of the times you know indians were self confident they knew what they could get from their own culture their own civilization their own traditions and they knew what was lacking what was deficient in the india of the 1930s and 40s and why they needed to engage with other parts of the world so they could see themselves in the mirror yeah um so you know flipping to the mirror itself i mean it seems so important um to think about the fact that you know i mean it, it is so important to have the engagement of those who are not from a society with that society and of course it's always the case that those who study india who are not indian may perhaps never understand certain things about india but it's also certainly true that those who study or live in india or engage with india will see things about india that indians will never see for themselves um and in that sense it seems that many of the people you um describe in this book were beginning to see very sharply um things that emerge as crises by let's say the late 90s or the early 2000s you know so for instance the question of the crisis of the environment yeah. is something um that was i was surprised to discover in a sense um was something that had become the kind of great issue um already in the 60s and 70s for some of these observers when you know the environmental mu- movements in the us had not themselves taken off absolutely i think that's absolutely true i mean i think uh, ketan uh, uh, mira ben and sarla devi were absolutely pioneering environmentalists but i want to just pick up on what you said on what people from outside can see uh, which people within can't and i want to give it a slightly different twist since i'm speaking to a university audience composed of distinguished scholars or of different ages and possibly some graduate students too one of the things that uh, i would like abhishek is for more scholars of south asia to do that doctoral research young scholars not all but more a greater proportion of scholars to do their doctoral research on a part of their country that is different from their own there are too many tamil tamils writing about tamil nadu and far too many bengalis writing about bengal all right now i think uh, all you know at this means <laughs> guilty so as charged guilty as charged <laughs> okay. yeah but maybe your next book or your next to next book your next to next book all right but you know but you are a hindu writing about about using using persian and and urdu and so also you are partly forgiven you know? <laughs> you are actually entering a different mental world not just in terms of time the 18th century you are not you know you were didn't didn't grow up um, i mean you are partly excused because you didn't grow up with persian and urdu as your languages so i would i would i would put you as a partial exception uh, to my to my uh, to my strictures you know i think this is something and also my late teacher dharma kumar used to often say so i i i put in two parts so what is if you are an indian uh, try to write about at some stage in your career obviously you know your language you know your province you want to leverage that expertise while writing your phd at some stage in your career try to write about some other state some other cultural region uh, uh, for example two of uh, if i give two examples of out uh, the great indian sociologist andre bete who is actually bengali speaker did his field work in tamil nadu uh that's one example and it's a classic book cast cast and pla incidentally published by the university of california press in berkeley still in print 50 years later a more recent example niladri bhattacharya a bengali speaking historian has written the landmark agrarian history of modern punjab right now so i think i hope more of this happens i also hope uh, in the spirit of challenging xenophobia my late teacher dharma kumar used to always say when we do comparative history we only look at the west why don't we look at india and indonesia india and iran you know you do some of that you will talk about india and indonesia if you look at our post colonial journeys i mean indonesia is incredibly fascinating in its cultural regional ecological diversity in its political turmoil so i think that is something uh, you know the kind of tendency the default tendency of scholars indian scholars i mean there are exceptions i mean down the coast from where you are there is the peerless sanjay subramaniam for example you know 
who has looked at many different parts of the world. So I think there are now a growing group of Indians who do first aid scholarship on China. And that's emerging. I think of young Arunab Ghosh in Harvard, of course, the venerable Prasanthi Dwara and Tansen Sen and others. So I think, I think it's very important. By all means, write one book on your region. I'm glad I wrote on Uttarakhand. I am from Uttarakhand. You know, but I'm also glad that through the life of Elvin, I moved into the Northeast and through the life of Keta, and I got to know a little bit about Tamil Nadu. So I think that's something uh, which I don't prescribe it to everyone. I'm saying it will be interesting. I mean, I've written this about uh, my, uh, my friend Partho Chatterjee the great Indian political theorist and cultural historian uh, who gave me my first job. So who, to whom I'm profoundly grateful in many, many ways. And when I was a young scholar, but I have said this, I wish Partho Chatterjee would write a book on Ambedkar. He's written on Bankim and Tagore and Bose. And I'm sure even, with, with, even without doing Marathi, Partho Chatterjee, the great political theorist, writing a full book on Ambedkar will tell you things about Ambedkar, the Marathi knowing scholars, won't really get to, you know, it won't be a perfect book on Ambedkar, but it'll provide insights which the homegrown Maharashtrian may not be able to give you. So I think it's a, I think broad, there's a lesson here also for scholars and the kinds of topics they take. I mean, uh, work on some other country. I mean, Sharachari, Sharachari worked on his native Tamil Nadu, but then he went to South Africa, but good for him. You know, more people should go, go down that path. I, I completely, you know, I completely, uh, I mean, I completely take sorry the for, point sorry of, for that, Sorry for that sermon, but that's okay. No, no, but I, I completely take the point uh, of intellectual adventure and Catholicity. And I must confess that I have much greater respect for uh, my colleagues, such as precisely Arnab Ghosh, who you mentioned, um, who, you know, work on places other than the place that they're from. So great, great, uh, great respect for that personally. Let me, let me say, let me ask a sort of relatively technical question, which is a self-interested question. And I, then we'll have room for one more or two more questions. So if anybody wants to pop anything else in the chat box, this is not a bad time. But the question is, you know, one of the things you do really masterfully in this book, Ram, is that, um, uh, you know, there are these beautiful movements in the book from the early lives of these people, the pre-Indian lives of these people, um, which occur with a sense of dispatch. Um, and then uh, sort of obviously a great attention to their time in India itself. Um, and so I was just wondering, as a biographer, how do you weigh the relative importance of childhood and early life? Um, in relation to you know middle age and old age and time in India and time after India, you could of course make the question that you know the experience of coming to India is clearly transformative for these people. So that in the sense they're not the same people who left those countries, but in another sense I am just curious how you weigh you know, the first twenty years of these that's lives. A, that's a fantastic question. With regard to this particular book, because there were seven and not just one. It was a group biography, a multiple biography, and it was their lives in India I was concerned with. I had to go relatively quickly over their growing up years. With regard to other books I've written, for example, on Gandhi and, uh, and Elwin, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's only about one individual. Obviously, the childhood is formative. There are two challenges for a biographer writing about the early years. One is uh, that there's very little documentation. And the second is connected. Uh, that such documentation as exists is usually in the form of an autobiography written by the subject himself or herself. You know, Ali Besson wrote an autobiography, for example. Gandhi and Elwin, my two previous biographical subjects, wrote autobiographies. Now, I believe uh, as a biographer, I treat the autobiography, any autobiography, as a preemptive strike against a future biographer. You know, they want to tell their story before somebody else comes and messes it around. So don't absolutely rely on the autobiography. Try to look for other sources. In the case of Elvin, for example, I found some school records, uh, some stuff in his college, Merton College, Oxford, you know, reports about him and so on. So try and look for sources other than those emanating from the subject, particularly if there's a very colorful and moving account of their childhood in the autobiography, tend to view it with a little bit of skepticism. I myself, uh, I'm not, I won't say I'm opposed to psychohistory, but I'm not trained to look in that direction. Uh, 
but it is i mean it can you'll have to look for other kinds of sources other than those for example with gandhi with elwin for example it was clear to me that the loss of his father and the overwhelming possessiveness of his mother over her eldest and most uh, and brilliant son was clearly part of his you know developing personality but that emerged later on from what i read later in life and how the way he would write to her uh, so there clearly he was very much shaped by that uh, gandhi i mean i was delighted while working on gandhi uh, to find his mark sheets his school mark sheets which uh, were printed in an obscure book in 1965 uh, and which gave and also which which also had not the school mark sheets but also the examination questions he wrote in his matriculation exam so i think to look for sources other than those but it is a challenge it is a challenge you know i think it is always a challenge uh, to you may have to fill in the picture of the city the town the religious context again that's important so with elwin i had to do something which i have never done before we used to try and understand the history of the anglican church and the schism between low church and high church which marked the way elwin grew up and his family viewed christianity for example so i think that broader context of uh, the theological cultural environment of that family the geographical setting so the ways in which you can flesh it out but if there's one lesson don't if your subject is that a biography don't has it an autobiography don't please don't excessively rely on it especially for the early members yeah yeah so uh, because i suppose we're running up towards the end of our allotted time sadly um you know let me ask you the slightly melancholic question of the afterlives of these figures you know any basant to me was first known um by the name of a street in delhi when i was growing up yeah. um and um you know uh it's not until i became a historian of any you know of any seriousness that i learned more than that about the the fact that she had a road named after her in in india and all of the other figures in this book who are you know delightful and compelling and um you know remarkable intellectual interlocutors to whom you convey us with such vividness um and color are people who had important things to say um yeah. through the 60s and 70s and 80s um and they have vanished from our discourse and our consciousness yeah. um some of them you know you say you say that some of their children continue to live in india but many of their children left and have gone back to the countries um from which they came um so that there are no you know uh living connections perhaps other than you know stokes's apples might be the potentially the greatest of all yeah, um yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the fruits the fruits of these you know enormous labors in india which of course is a is a slightly melancholic prospect um so how how do we make sense of you know as a historian how do we make sense of these enormous efforts these these you know great engagements um and then they're vanishing i mean you end your book with a plea to listen yeah um yeah you know uh my answer to that would be twofold to your very important and pertinent question one is um uh to uh invoke my the historian who most shaped me when i was young and uh, to quote his most famous quote you know i was trying in my own modest way to rescue, rescue these seven people from the enormous condescension of posterity you know so so that's that's part of what i was trying to do and to bring their lives and their struggles and their ideas and and what could be their legacies uh, to a new audience who didn't know them you know uh so that's one part the other part of the question i'll let me answer again uh by, by referring to what i said earlier in our discussion abhishek about every work of history being part of a conversation drawing on what has been written before hopefully spurring new lines of inquiry now i think for example uh among these seven subjects i think one deserves a full fledged biography that's meera ben there is material and there's a great title at least in uh, in hindi which would be bapu ki beti you know and of course rebellious sometimes rebellious daughter and so on i like alliteration so that would kind of work but she i think i have had a very interesting complicated life including something we've not talked about so far which is her desperately falling in love with a bearded 
Punjabi revolutionary and Gandhi being unhappy about it, right? So we haven't talked about that so far. So I think she probably deserves a full-fledged biography. I think uh, the Bombay Chronicle, a biography of a newspaper, is something I think would be a great idea. And finally, what I would hope for, and if my book could contribute in some modest way to that, I'd be delighted. What we really lack, um, among the things we lack, um, Abhishek, among the many things we lack in our understanding of post-independent in South Asia, is a history of the Gandhian constructive work movement after Gandhi died. You mentioned Vinoba Bhave, you know, but why, why constructive work was so important to Gandhi? Why did it fizzle out? What, did, it, did its relative lack of success have something to do with opening a space for the rise of the RSS, which has a very different vision of what constructive work is about, right? Uh, uh, what about its influence in other countries? You know, one of my favorite people in South Asia is a man called Akhtar Hamid Khan, who was in the ICS and left the ICS uh, to start first to do rural development work in Bangladesh, and then to start the Orangi Urban Development Project in Karachi. who was a Gandhian who wore khati, you know. So I think a history of the Gandhian constructive work movement, its achievements, its failures, its fizzling out, I think is uh, something which I hope several things I say in this book, I only hint at, uh, can provoke. So it doesn't have to be the individual legacies. Only Miraban deserves probably a full-fledged biography. But some of the things they thought about, argued, argued for, stood for, uh, I think hopefully those can, you know, uh, percolate at least into the scholarly consciousness, if not the popular consciousness. Yeah. Um, so one last question. I, it seems to me in reading this book, um, now that I think about it, that um, for all of the things that these people were fighting, um, for India, when they were fighting for India, they weren't fighting for the Indian nation state. Mm -hmm. um, and they, 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 they weren't fighting for the blue passport or the coming into the existence of the blue passport. Um, and in many ways, they, I think all of them to some degree, um, felt betrayed to some degree by the nation state, even though it's amazing to see, for instance, that the nation state and the organs of the nation state valued their participation uh, from the form of pensions you know, yeah. for instance, which you trace, which were given, which is very important. I mean, it's remarkable to see that, you know, this poor third world country is, you know, sending quite a significant number of rupees to Mirabin um, yeah. while she resides yeah. in Austria. So that's, you know, so, so that's so that's kind of interesting. These are people, and it's also interesting to see, as you mentioned, you know, Abdul Ghaffar Khan come to India and berate everybody for not being good Gandhians yeah. and yeah. not having, you know, not having done enough. Um, and presumably people taking that. So, so Gandhi, in a sense, did not know national boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I want to end with the last question for today, which actually comes from Asha Bajaj, which is this question, you know, which is, um, you know, how do we locate the story of national boundaries and xenophobia uh, in this era is, is, you know, in this post globalization era? How do we make sense of these histories? Um, as you fly into a country that now has the world's largest illuminated electrified border. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I, it's a complicated question. I myself, I mean, I think national boundaries are here to stay. Okay. Nation states are not going away anywhere. I myself have in the past written with skepticism about the idea of the world citizen, you know, uh, uh, as J.B.S. Holden famously said, there is no world state. One of the duties of a citi citizen is to hold his state to account, and he only has his or her national state. So holding your nation state to account, uh, forging relations of peace and solidarity and understanding with other nation states, interacting with their cultures, uh, you know, their traditions, their philosophies. Uh, the two epigraphs to this book are from Gandhi and Tagore, you know, uh, respectively. And I think their writings in different ways tell us a lot. If I may end with one book recommendation, uh, very relevant to this book and to the world as we are today. Uh, it's a book by, edited by Savas, the late historian Savas Sachi Bhattacharya. It's called The Mahatma and the Poet. It's an account of the extraordinary range of uh, empathetic and critical and sometimes adversarial 
exchanges between Tagore and Gandhi. The problem with the book is that it's published by the National Book Trust, which means everyone can afford it and no one knows where to get it. Someone should do, <laughs> someone should do an illegal PDF and put it online. You know, I think it's a fabulous, I mean, Gandhi and Tagore are, I mean, in some ways, as far as Indians go, there will be other thinkers, you know, I think who, uh, whose thought, whose life, whose struggles, whose legacies, I think provide the best uh, kind of positive and constructive answer to the question that Asha has posed. And I think yeah. they really lie behind this book. I mean, that's why, though this is a book about seven foreigners, it starts with epigraphs from, from Gandhi and Tagore. Yeah, well, I think um, we're running out of time, um, though we could continue this fascinating discussion endlessly. And I sincerely and truly hope, Ram, that we will see you in Berkeley um, sometime in the near future, I said, in person it's, this time. It's only the only place in America for which I would get up at 4.30 a.m. is the University of California at Berkeley. Let me put that well, out record again. Well, thank you. But hopefully next time, the next time you get up at 4.30, you'll be getting up to get into a plane to come here. Oh, um, so we so we look forward to seeing yeah. you in person. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for taking this time, thank and I hope everybody has the chance to read and engage this really fascinating book. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. bye.